and welcome to this episode of For Your Consideration. My name is Guy and today we're looking at five ways of making combat more interesting. Now we're not talking specifically combat on floating machines over pools of lava or hanging upside down or on the back of a jet plane. We're not talking about situations that make combat more interesting. We're talking about the way in which you describe and handle combat to make it more interesting. There are, in my opinion, five key factors that you can utilize to really make your game work better. Now, something that I need to emphasize before we even start on this journey is that although there are five ways of making combat more interesting, you don't need to apply all five to every single situation, to every single dice roll. That can become too much. It can slow combat down quite a lot. Sometimes a hit is just a hit. Sometimes a miss is just a miss. You don't have to go into this elaborate description using these five different methods to make that hit a spectacularly amazing narrative point every single time. Sometimes you can just move through. And it's about getting a balance between the two that will allow your players to get the joy of a very rich, well and interesting combat without spending the entire session slowly working through a play-by-play -play of each and every single hit. I think I've made my point, so moving on. Number one, the very first way of making combat more interesting is to look at the weapon that the character is wielding and ask what we expect from it or what was its design purpose. So when a character swings a war hammer at the opponent, what was a war hammer designed to do? A war hammer, much like a mace, although much more pointed, was designed to bend plate mail armor and to fracture bones and burst organs. It was a particularly nasty little creature. It was also designed to puncture through and cause even more damage because of such a small point of contact. So a hammer is a particularly vicious weapon. That's what we expect from it. It's this short, hard, hitting sound. This, this is what we expect. As opposed to a longsword, which is designed to slice, it's designed to thrust, it's designed to hack from a distance. That's what we expect it to do. It's not close up and it's not personal. Daggers are close up and personal. Lightsabers are supposed to float through the air because they have no weight to them, or very little weight anyway, which is what supposedly makes them so dangerous. A pole arm is supposed to be held at length to keep one's enemies even further away or swung around in great big circles to clear out these big patches within the battlefield as everyone steps back to try and avoid this pole arm that's busy swinging around wildly. So what do we expect? Once you've worked out what you expect, you can tailor your descriptions specific to that weapon. So it's not just, I hit with a longsword, I hit with a lightsaber. I need to know more. I slice with that longsword. With the lightsaber, I make quick, simple little actions with the wrist rather than with my entire arm because I don't need to actually do that. It's visually more dramatic, but I don't actually need to do that. There's no force behind a lightsaber except for the force. But you know what I'm saying. I don't want to force the issue. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Anyway, right, so that's one way, is what is the expectation or the design of the weapon and how can we use that to describe, to describe the way in which the attack is done? Another thing to look at, and this is particularly within fantasy games as well as in certain science fiction games, what is the color of the power? How does it visually manifest? So often I have players go, oh, I cast a firebolt. What color is your firebolt? Uh, it's orange. Sure, that's fine. It's a burning, flaming orange with tinges of yellow in it. And at its very core, it's bright white because it's so hot. The color of the magic, there's no rule saying that firebolt has to be orange. It could be purple with tinges of green. It could be pink that slowly changes color to a deep dark red on the edges. It could sparkle. It couldn't, instead of being a solid lump of flame, perhaps it isn't a lump of flame. 
perhaps scorching bolt or fiery bolt or whatever you want to call it maybe it's actually a series of tendrils of fire that streak out rather than a globule it's a streaking who knows who knows you do or at least your players might so then you can incorporate that into making your magic attacks also that much more interesting and it gives differentiation if the necromancer's magic is always green which is what we expect that's absolutely fine but what if it's purple what if it's black what if it's pure white what if it's light blue all of these things help you to describe things in a better way and then you can twist it so that every spell whether it's levitation they're these little tendrils of blue energy washing off of the character's feet as they rise up into the air you can use that to make your descriptions better. Next up, number three. I can't read my notes. Ah, I can. <laughs> I'm trying to read Gorv. It's not Gorv, it's Gore. Gore is entirely up to you. Some players don't mind Gore, some players do. So you need to assess what your players feel about gore. Can you describe how as they hit, they feel the rib cracking underneath? Can you describe how as the blade hits the skin, there's that moment of resistance where the skin pushes back and then there's suddenly a release as the blade then slides all the way through? Can you describe as the blade sticks out of the back of the figure that there is this point where the skin stretches out over it and then suddenly the skin peels open and the blade pours out and then blood sprays out, spilling around on the ground? Is that what you can describe or do your players not like that? Do they not really want to focus too much on seeing the layer of fat and then the layer of muscle and the bone pink and shiny as the blade or the hatchet cuts through or as the lightsaber slices through the torso, this blackened mass as all of the soft tissue is burnt to a crisp because of the energy of the blade? How gory can you be? That's entirely up to you. And again, think about what the weapon is designed to do. If it's a warhammer, you're not going to describe how the character's arm falls off. On the other hand, you might describe how his arm suddenly twists out at 90 degrees and it looks as if he's got two elbows because the upper um, arm, femur, I want to say femur, uh, is broken and it's hanging at 90 degrees and then his elbow is hanging at 90 degrees. How far do you want to go with that? So that's entirely up to you, but it can add a certain amount of drama, especially if as the character gets punched, blood sprays out of the corner of his mouth and splats across the face of one of the characters. And then he steps back, wiping it from his... It's entirely up to you. Now, you can also use the emotional tone the drama is the character fighting desperately are their attacks furtive are they just going into a frenzy you can describe the emotional state of the wielder maybe not necessarily for the player characters because they will know how their characters are feeling in the combat but certainly for the npcs the goblin who's completely overwhelmed you can see that he's just hacking at anything that comes near him his face, this grimace of fear and terror and sweat pours down his features as he slices and misses with his dagger. That's a lot more interesting than just, oh, he misses. That's the idea, right? So using the emotional state of the individuals to describe the attack helps to make the attack feel that much more real, to get a sense of what's going on. Again, you can mix it up with gore, as well as, of course, what is the expectation of the weapon that they're wielding. Is the tired woman who wields a double-handed warhammer, does she swing it and it kind of causes her to spin around twice where she moans out in frustration that she can't use this weapon correctly? Is it a simple, quick little dagger which she jabs in multiple times while screaming in, in absolute hatred at this figure this figure that she is now killing how do we how do we use the emotions to describe the attack then finally the last thing that we look at is the senses you should be using the five senses as often as you can to describe scenes for players it helps to make it just that much better so when we're talking about combat we're talking about what do you see 
the movements. They take up a defensive stance. They move back. You don't have to necessarily recreate every hit. Oh, 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 no. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You can, if you like, but you should describe it. They jolt to the side, their arm twitching up in defense. Their head snaps back. You can use all those kinds of wonderful descriptive words to show us, tell the players what they see so they can see it in their mind's eye. When we hear stuff, what are we hearing? Is the opponent groaning? Is they, are they screaming out in pain when they get hit? Are they laughing with delight as they happily just slice through everybody? Are they absolutely quiet as they concentrate firing their blaster at the enemy? What do we hear? What do we feel? Now this again is entirely up to you. The jolt of the swords as they slash against each other and smack up against each other's blades. The movement of the armor as you rotate out of the way to avoid the incoming attack. The physical nature of flesh being smacked, slashed, cut, burnt, obliterated, dissolved. All those kinds of things. What do we feel? Physically feel smell what do we smell in combat there is such a strong sense of aroma that it's it's very well worth exploring that idea and think of specific things if it's just oh there's a general smell in the air no, that doesn't mean anything there is the smell of fish rotting dried fish that old scent of the sea that permeates this entire area mustard jasmine Sweet smells, horrid smells, smells help to really put the players in that situation. And of course, taste. What can you taste during combat? Well, you can certainly taste blood when you bite your own lip or when you get smacked across the jaw. There is that blood that's happening within the mouth. That happens very frequently as a LARPer, I know. Even with foam weaponry, often you kind of go, oh... I'm tasting blood in my mouth because I tripped, I fell, I spoke too quickly, whatever. I got hit in the head with an axe. doesn't matter. The idea is you tell them what they can taste. Now, if you have ever been around a body, not necessarily a human body, but uh, an animal that's been killed for whatever reason, there is a definite taste in the air. There's that kind of coppery scent. We can smell it, but we also end up starting to taste it slightly. That gamey taste or the taste of sweat that's dripping through your moustache into your mouth, or if you don't have a moustache, it's just pouring into your mouth, whatever people who don't have moustaches do. All of those kinds of things can be brought to the fore. So those are the five ways that I try and make combat that much more interesting, that much more real. And again, not every hit needs to be described in this meticulous way. Sometimes it can just be you smash your weapon into him. Next player. You roll out of the way, you come up, you taste, that sweat stings in your eyes because it's so hot and that dust is everywhere. Your mouth is dry, your blade is ready, the orc in frustration. You can then expound and expand on certain, certain aspects within that combat. I hope this has been inspirational at the very least in terms of how to up your combat and make it that much more interesting. Thank you to you for suggesting this as a topic, by the way. I do appreciate it. If you have more topics to suggest, get on over to the website. You can log them with us there, as well as, of course, you can leave comments below. If you didn't know, YouTube is closing down the messaging system, so you won't be able to send private messages through to the channel anymore. So bear that in mind. Leave your comments below. I do read them on every video. Until next time, if you haven't discovered RPGTableFinder.com yet, what are you waiting for? Head on over and have a look. If you also haven't discovered WorldAnvil.com, well, you should go and have a look at that as well. It's definitely something to look out for if you are trying to design your campaign in its entirety. Literally everything down from the types of documents that you might find within the world, all the way through to the different deities and the different uh, people, the maps, histories, buildings, all that is all held in WorldAnvil.com. Dot com. They're one of our affiliates. And if you're a Pathfinder player and you're looking for information on how to play Pathfinder, head on over to Ask a Pathfinder. They, uh, Michael is running his shows now. Um, well done to you, Michael, for getting onto YouTube. He's been going for a little bit, a little bit of a while now. So there are a couple of videos for you to go and have a look at. He talks you through everything there is to know about Pathfinder. He is, of course, 
ask a Pathfinder. It makes sense. He used to play Mutaro on the Windswift, and he's now the GM on the Adventures of the Star Swift. The Star, sorry, the Star. <laughs> oh, getting tongue tied. The Star Swift Chronicles. The Star Swift Chronicles, in which I am playing the captain of that starship, and that's going to come out shortly as well. Very exciting on that. So askapathfinder.com, worldanvil.com, rpgtablefinder.com, and have a blast. Until next time, have a great weekend.